Hello, my name is Sergey Petonia and this is a talk about improving MariaDB Square Optimizer with better quality estimates. Now, before we talk about improvement, let's have some background overview. What are the selectivity estimates and why are they important? MariaDB Query Optimizer uh, is a cost-based query optimizer, so when it searches for the best query plan, it makes use of data statistics. Uh, table cardinalities, condition selectivities, and so forth. Let's review those in, in greater detail. <clears throat> Let's consider a query, a typical join between, say, orders and line item, with some condition on orders and some condition on line item. Uh, the first number that the optimizer will go to concern itself with is, <coughs> is the number of rows. We use the term cardinality for that. Cardinality is a number of rows, so the first we're going to look at the cardinality of, of table orders. Uh, then, uh, it, uh, before joining this table with uh, other table, can, a local condition will likely be applied, and it will filter some out, filter out some records. Uh, so uh, the optimizer will, will consider the number of rows left after the local condition check. We call it condition selectivity. Uh, the same goes for line item. After that, it will perform a join operation, and uh, after join, uh, some number of record combinations will be produced, and then the optimizer will compute join output cardinality, and so forth. So, cardinality and as you see, cardinality and selectivity are closely related. Uh, so, let's define uh, selectivity. <clears throat> let's give a definition to be on the same page. Uh, the condition selectivity is the number of rows satisfied condition divided by total number of rows. That is, it's the cardinality uh, after the condition was applied divided by cardinality the condition before was applied. This is a fraction, so often it is multiplied by 100%. Uh, typical numbers like selectivity of 0 or 0% 0 means that no rows were accepted. Selectivity of 1 or 100% means that all rows were accepted. Selectivity of 0.33 or 33% means that one row in three was accepted. Uh, selectivity is uh, very important. It's probably the most important parameter that the optimizer has to deal with. <clears throat> Let me illustrate that with the detail. Uh, <clears throat> suppose Suppose we have a now three table join. We are looking for customers, uh, their orders, and the items in that order. And we have conditions on customer as well as on order and on the price of item in the order. Uh, suppose they, they are considering this join, uh, doing the join from customer, then accessing table orders, then line item. Ooh. For most access methods, uh, the cost of reading orders. It depends on for how many customers you want to order you want to read the orders for. For example, if you got if you want twice as many if you've got twice as many customers of interest, then you will have to read twice as many orders and it will be twice as expensive. Uh, now suppose we've made this the advisor made this error and uh, it it thinks that it will have to it, it will get two times as many customers as it will actually get after applying the condition on customer. Uh, okay, that means that we'll, it will, we will also think that we will scan twice as many orders. And then if the optimizer makes another error and thinks that each order has three times as many items in it, this will end up in reading six more, two times three, six more items from line item table. And that is the cardinality errors spread from one part of the query plan to another, and they are multiplied. For comparison, cost uh, errors, cost model errors are typically not, typically don't. If you, if you think that reading table customer is twice as expensive than it actually is, well, this doesn't spread, uh, the reading table orders uh, remains the same, and so with line item. So the errors in uh, Costs are added, while errors and cardinality are multiplied. And this can cause really dramatic difference for a large production query with, say, 10 tables or 20. It is not uncommon to 
see the real number of uh, rows read from the last table in the join to be in the matter of say hundreds or thousands, while the optimizer, uh, because of all, all the errors in the cardinality estimation, the optimizer's estimates is in an order of hundreds of millions. Uh, so it, uh, getting the selectivity wrong is the most frequent error of the optimizer totally missing the point about what the cost of the query plan will be. So how does one compute selectivity? How does one compute this important parameter? Uh, well, uh, there are two kinds of uh, uh, like uh, uh, things that are compute. First is the local condition selectivity, where we are interested in selectivity of conditions which are uh, use column, column only one table. Actually, typically most of them is a column compared with some constant in some way. And then there is joint condition selectivity, but that is another topic. This talk will be mostly discussing local condition selectivity. Local condition selectivity. <clears throat> uh, okay, so we are looking at the, what can be done to predict selectivity of the conditions, uh, like here in examples. Uh, if you open database textbook, the first thing you, uh, the first suggestion will be to use so-called guesstimates. Uh, well, if there is, a, for example, column equals constant, uh, then assume the selectivity of that is 10 percent. Or if it is less or less or equal, or greater than constant, then assume that condition has selectivity of 50%, and so forth. This is, of course, very basic and very inaccurate because it doesn't have any information about the distribution, data distribution in the table. So, in order to get more, uh, more, preci more precise estimates, one can use histograms or other kind of pre-collected uh, data synapses. Uh, and the, the other option which is typically suggested in the research literature is to perform sampling. Uh, read a certain amount of rows in the table and see how often the condition is satisfied. Uh, MySQL and MariaDB also have some a bit unconventional way to <coughs> unconventional way to produce selectivity estimates is called records in range estimates. Basically, the idea is that if there is an index on columns, uh, we use the index as a really large histogram. Uh, use, reading this histogram is expensive, but uh, on the other hand, that histogram is really large and is always up to date. Uh, I'll get back to discussing records of the range later in this talk. Okay, so histograms. <coughs> Uh, basic histogram, uh, the most basic histogram to think of is a value list histogram. If you've got values, you just uh, make a list of values and the number of times each one was encountered. Uh, well, this works uh, as long as the total number of values is limited and you can fit them all in the histogram. MySQL actually collects such histograms and calls them singleton histograms. But uh, if the, if the values do not, if there are many different values and they don't fit in your list, uh, then you need a real histogram. When one thinks of a histogram, they typically think of something like this. Uh, there are predefined bucket bounds. Uh, often there are also fixed, like in this picture from 10, 20, 30. And uh, then uh, each bar uh, is the height of the bar is proportional to the number of uh, rows that got into this bucket. Uh, and this is what we think of when we think of when we hear the word histogram. Well, this kind of histogram exists. It's called Equibif histogram. Uh, it's easy to collect, uh, but it has accuracy issues. Uh, like here we see in an example that there are a few outlier values in peripheral buckets, and they take nearly half of the buckets in the histogram. While most values are concentrated in a few very popular buckets, and there our precision suffer because we don't have that many buckets. Uh, so the question is, what if densely populated regions had more buckets, while sparsely populated regions had less? Uh, there is such variant of a histogram, it's called uh, equi-hate histogram. Uh, here, 
I show the conversion of equi with histogram on top to the equi height histogram. Uh, the idea is to put the same number of rows in each bucket, uh, while bucket, uh, uh, in order to accommodate them, the, the, the bucket sizes will change. Uh, <coughs> here we see that the first bucket was uh, cover a, a large. Uh, a, a, a large uh, range of constants because there are only few values here and then the buckets get smaller because there are the density is higher so there is more so there is no precision degradation in the popular part of the histogram equi hate histograms are known to have better precision than equi histograms uh, another nice property that they have that you can collect them with one pass uh, there exist other kinds of histograms, but uh, which are even more precise than equihate histogram. Uh, however, they are harder to collect. And most production databases use uh, equihate histograms. <coughs> uh, if you look at MariaDB, uh, has the equihate, hist equihate histogram, although it, it calls it hate balanced. Uh, from version 10.0 to 10.6 and 10.7 there are another kind of equi histogram. The same thing by SQL 8. PostgreSQL uses most common value list and whatever is not there is put into equi histogram. Cockroach and TIDB also use equi histogram and TIDB has a variant of most common value list. I put star here where the equi histogram is actually not exactly equi -hate. We'll get to this in a few slides. <coughs> Uh, histograms in MariaDB, uh, they were actually introduced quite a while ago in MariaDB 10.0. Uh, they weren't enabled by default. Uh, you needed to manually collect them, uh, update them. And you, are, you also are then needed to enable, to make the enable their usage by the optimizer. And the uh, <clears throat> collection of the histogram was expensive because there were space consumption issues with big varchar call. So, uh, <coughs> that, still we felt that that feature is kind of used less than it deserves. So in MariaDB 10, four steps were made to um, make histogram closer to, histograms closer to being on by default. The, the settings, default settings were changed so that the optimizer would use histograms if they are present. Uh, but still you need to some non issue some special analyze command to collect the histogram. Uh, in order to combat high, uh, uh, high cost of collecting the histogram, we have added Bernoulli sampling, analyze sample percentage variable, which is by default is set to store where it still uses all data, or you can set it to lower value, and then histogram collection will have less overhead. Uh, the, the, the value of zero, it will actually pick the percentage to sample automatically. Uh, well, however, it will still do full table scan and will walk through the whole table. <coughs> Some details about how histogram work worked in the, before 10.7. <coughs> so, as, as I said before, it is an, it is an equidepth histogram, which is called hate balanced. The, it's a little bit uncommon, not uh, like in other databases. Uh, the histograms are very compact because the histogram is basically the story of fractions. Fraction is a number between 0 and 1, where 0 is the minimum value in the table, 1 is the maximum value in the table. Here in blue, I show what is stored for this histogram. First, we store the minimum value, which is 10 here, and uh, the Le le leftmost bound is 0, 0.0 because it's a minimum value. We don't actually store this number. But then we start storing this number of 40 is uh, in the middle between minimum value and maximum value. Uh, the fraction is 42 and th th that is the fraction is stored. Uh, then the second, then the next boundary between buckets uh, is at this fraction and so forth and so forth and so forth. And uh, it ends all with the fraction of 1.0, where we store the maximum value, which is 80 for this histogram. <coughs> uh, the fractions are stored as a fixed precision numbers, so either one byte or two byte. 
uh, two byte precision. Uh, the, this histogram is very compact and it works well for ranges, but it is not as good for uh, the case where you have popular values because you don't store fractions. You don't really see if you are hitting the value, the value or not. And for our char columns, which uh, uh, where <coughs> represent, one can compute a fraction of one varchar string between two others, but that's not, not very precise. Uh, th there is a very good demonstration uh, of this issue in this MDF, uh, where I have generated uh, one million population of, say, users uh, with country field, and th the distribution of country field matches real country's population, so as if people were coming all over the world, and there will be like more people from China than, say, from Switzerland. Uh, and then I try to see whether histo collect the histogram and try to see how well it predicts the selectivity of the var condition. I run analyze command, it gives me rows, there is one billion. Ex exp the optimizer expects to find one billion rows and it actually gets one million rows. Then there is a filtered column, which is an estimate of uh, how many rows will be left after this condition is applied, which fraction, in percentage. Uh, and the real filter is, is what was observed. And here we see that for China it's actually quite close. We expected that 22% of uh, population will be from China, actually we got 21. Uh, but uh, if you take an adjacent uh, value that's adjacent to China, Chile, Chile and uh, Chile has a much smaller population, but we still get nearly the same, uh, the, the same estimate. Here it looks exactly the same, but that's, it's actually a little bit off. If you use other form of explain, you can see that. Uh, but it, let's look at, say, other country which is not, not large, but not close to, chi to chi China in the alphabet. For Sweden, uh, we, get, we expect 4%, we get 0.15%. Well, a, a better estimate. So, uh, uh, we decided to fix that, and we fixed it that it started with a GSOC Google Summer of Code 21 project by Michael Okoko, uh, <coughs> where we have introduced a new histogram type. It's called JSON HB. It stores uh, values, not fractions. The histogram is stored as JSON. The histogram is uh, hate balanced or equi hate. Uh, it's almost hate balanced. Uh, the, de the deviation from being perfectly hate balanced is that common values are put in their own buckets. So the histogram in, uh, sort of includes the most common value list. And if we rerun the test from uh, uh, that MDF uh, with JSON HB histogram. We set the histogram type, we collect the histogram, we run analyze, and now we see that okay, China got slightly more precise. Uh, the estimate for Chile is now much better. <coughs> it's a little bit off, but it's not orders of magnitude off. Uh, and the estimate for Sweden was slightly improved. So, <coughs> uh, uh, this JSON HB histogram is uh, more precise. Uh, let's look how it looks internally. Now I'm using a bit different data set, uh, uh, a table of vehicles registered in an Australian state. Uh, well, if you if you look at the histogram, you see that uh, it's JSON. It starts with a, it is JSON object where there is one member, and uh, there internally it has an array of buckets. Each bucket has a start value, <laughs> it has a size, a uh, fraction of table rows in this bucket. As you see, this can vary. Uh, and the reason, as I already mentioned, that the popular values are in their own bucket. For example, here, Camry is apparently very popular in Australia, so it got its own bucket. And DV is a number of distinct values in the bucket. So you see that there's a fraction is larger than in other buckets, and this is just one value here. Uh, this is actually quite similar to what other databases store. If you look at MySQL's histogram, well, we wouldn't see much because they use this encoding. Uh, they in in encode the constants in base 64. Uh, 
but if you decode, uh, you see, you actually can see the values. They store minimum, maximum, cumulative fraction, and number of distinct values. Uh, the bucket, the, they need to store cumulative fraction because buckets may have different sizes. Uh, as far as I understand, there are two reasons. One of them is that the same as, my, as in MariaDB, popular values go into their own bucket. I think also they have the rule that each value should be in one bucket. So if the bucket boundary uh, comes, cuts the value in two, they will move the bucket to either to the left or to the right to make sure that each value is in one bucket. Uh, however, uh, they don't. Uh, there, there seems to be a bug in this uh, logic because I have encountered cases where the histogram was very um, non equivocate with apparently suffering performance. Uh, I have filed it here. You can check out the details. Yeah. Uh, one other interesting thing is that there are holes between packets because here we see it. Uh, this bucket begins with Kaddi, this one starts with Kalais, so there are there is a hole uh, between values. I'm not exactly sure what was their motivation for this. Mm. Um, if you look at other databases, for example, Cockroach DB, they are also open source, so it's possible to uh, take a look. Uh, they present uh, their histogram as a table. Although it's not stored internally that way, you can just view. And they just store the upper bound. <coughs> they store it. the range rows is the number of rows between this bound and previous. Uh, and previous bound, basically number of rows in this bucket accepted at the end point. It's not exactly, you can see that it varies, so the histogram is not exactly equivocate. I think the, this, the, 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 the cause is the same as MySQL. Uh, interesting thing that they also store how many e rows were equal to the upper bound. So basically, this essentially this means that you have uh, after each bucket you have also a singleton bucket, which uh, has just one like a value that was a bucket bound and got its own bucket, uh, denoted here in blue. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is just something that number that they got for free from their collection algorithm or there is some deeper idea behind it. Uh, TIDB is also open source, so it's very easy to take a look. The first thing is that they store top N um, separately. Here they you see that the camera is put into top N and you don't see it in, in the histogram. Uh, <coughs> they follow my scroll that they store lower and upper bounds, so there are holes. Uh, count is cumulative number of values, so the histogram is not exactly equivocate. Again, uh, and they have the same thing that uh, CockroachDB has at uh, the occurrence number of the upper bound. So upper bound uh, is kind of in its own bucket. <coughs> Uh, NDV is all zero here, they have two collection algorithms, so one of them do apparently doesn't support it. Uh, <clears throat> last one that we will gonna look at is PostgreSQL. Uh, they got the, the, they had the histograms way before the all other databases, and it looked like this. They, first they take the most common values and extract them uh, from the data, uh, like store them separately. And then they get histogram bounds. And they just store the histogram bounds, that is, they don't, their histogram is exactly equivocate, uh, and they store the value at the bound. Uh, on the number of buckets that each database uses, PostgreSQL uses, by default, uh, collects 100 most common values and then st uses 100 buckets. In MySQL, the total number of buckets is 100, so if there are common values that this one is split. CockroachDB uses 200 buckets, so it seems to be some uh, popular number. But for non-indexing columns, the histogram is always has just two buckets. I assume they just want to minimum and maximum value. In TIDB, I couldn't really understand their logic. The number of buckets seem to vary between 50 and 
Toch gaan we het 50-50 using some kind of rule. Uh, in MariaDB, we have histogram size 254, which gives you 254 buckets with single prec HB and uh, half that number with double prec HB. Uh, JSON, uh, for JSON histograms, uh, uh, they're not the default yet. Well, if you just don't touch it, you will, you will get 254 buckets. Now, here it would be, one could expect like to do a histogram, kind of histogram benchmark, but uh, I decided against doing it because it's hard to do apple to apple comparison, uh, because histograms are slightly different. Also, some databases use sampling, while some use full scan collection, which affects the precision. And uh, it's difficult how to compare histogram sizes, like our most common do most common values count as buckets? What if buckets with two bounds versus buckets with one? Is it do they count as one bucket or the two bucket? In general, I think that if we, as we as we will see further in the talk, uh, we don't really need to push uh, it the envelope here. Adequate histogram precision is enough. There are other issues in selectivity estimates, so probably single column histogram precision as such is not the Mm. <coughs> our biggest problem. Okay, takeaways for histogram. MariaDB 10.7 is getting new histogram type JSON HB. It provides histograms similar to other databases. Uh, they are almost hey balanced. Uh, common values uh, are included in the histogram but stored in their own buckets. Uh, well, currently this new histogram type is not the default, but we are looking at whether we should make, to consider making it the default in the next release. Things that are still missing, I think, is that number one is genuine sampling. So if collection was cheaper, uh, it, it would be nicer. Uh, and uh, if we had a cheap uh, histogram collection, we could enable automatic histogram recollection. At the moment, we don't do it. The primary reason being that it's expensive. You don't want sudden spikes of workload on the server. <coughs> okay, that's for histograms. Uh, but uh, histograms, histogram just gives you selectivity of one column. So what do you do if you, your where condition typically has several uses several con several conditions on several columns? Uh, here is an example. Suppose you want to items ordered around Christmas, and then there is also condition on item name, Christmas light, or maybe it is a swimsuit. <coughs> How do you compute the combined selectivity? Well, you, the first observation to make is that you don't actually know if these two were independent and you need to multiply the selectivities, because there is some overlap. If the conditions are dependent, then uh, in the worst case, uh, you just need to take the greatest selectivity. Like suppose, I suppose all Christmas lights are ordered around Christmas, but there are also other stuff ordered. In the worst case, uh, uh, <coughs> here are the Christmas orders and here are the swimsuit orders. Maybe there is no overlap or almost no overlap. The solution number one is to use certain assumption. Uh, First, uh, the first apparent thing to do is that you combine conditions on the same column. You typically can kind of merge them together to get one range. Uh, then the textbook suggests to assume the conditions are independent and multiply the selectivities. Uh, the con oh, or you can use the conservative estimate and uh, try to not be too optimistic and take the just take the greatest selectivity and assume that the other one. Uh, doesn't add anything. <coughs> An interesting solution is in uh, so-called exponential back-off, which was introduced at least in the score server 2014, maybe used somewhere else. The first order conditions by selectivity, the most selective go first, and then we multiply selectivity 1 by square root of selectivity 2 by fourth root of selectivity 3, and so forth. Basically, assume that we take all of the selectivity 1, half of the selectivity of S2, quarter of selectivity of S3, and so forth. <coughs> this list doesn't continue because subsequent members would be closer to 1, anyway. 
but neither of these methods actually use any information about how are the whether the conditions are correlated and if yes how they correlate. So the results are bad, and the real uh, in order to have, obtain the real results, you need multi-column statistics. Well, multi-column statistics. If you just collect multi-column histogram, it, it would take a lot of space. It will be very large in order to be any precise. Although I see that the IDB does support them, although they have an issue which I'm not sure whether it's useful for them. In PostgreSQL, because <coughs> actually in the recent version, versions did some improvements too. Uh, support multi-column statistics. The most notable is multi-variate, most common value lists. Interesting that MySQL and MariaDB uh, have been on the forefront here for a very long time. They have records in range statistics which do provide multi-column, uh, which are sort of multi-column statistics. Uh, suppose you have an index on multiple columns and you have a where condition the optimizer will build a list of ranges over this lexicographic ordering. This is a complex topic, so I will have to, I can't cover it here. In MariaDB, you can check the optimizer place and see what ranges are generated for your conditions. Beware, my SQL, you don't print them correctly. Uh, and then the index is used as a large histogram, uh, and the call to query the index to tell how many rows uh, are in certain range is called records and range, and that's why they estimate records and range. Uh, <coughs> if you want to see this in action, uh, let's use the vehicle database, vehicle registration database again. Let's create an index on car vehicle make, and then follow the vehicle model. Then try getting an estimate on a frequently occurring combination for focus. And we get an estimate, and this is, well, the same order of magnitudes, let's put it within 2x uh, of the actual amount. And then let's try a combination that doesn't exist, like Mitsubishi didn't make a focus, and we get an estimate of 1, which is basically 0, copied up in order to not cause multiply by 0, meltdown in the optimizer. So you see, the estimates are actually good. If you compare that to PostgreSQL, or say, say of or say typical database, uh, <coughs> without without multivariate statistics, you get this rows 383, which is basically multiplication of fraction of fourths multiplied by fraction of focuses, which is way <coughs> smaller than the reality. And if you try Mitsubishi focus, you get a slightly lower estimate of 347. Uh, which just the difference just explained this is a fraction of Mitsubishi multiplied by a fraction of focuses. So you see that the optimizer is not able to uh, get a good estimate of single column statistics. If you add multivariate statistics here, uh, on for the situation improves. Ford focus is a is in multi, most common value list, so we get the estimate of uh, almost 5,000, which is close uh, to reality. Uh, however, Mitsubishi focus is not in the MCV list and uh, uh, this statistics doesn't that, that doesn't help PostgreSQL to see that this is a non-existent combination and you will still get the old multiplication of selectivity results. So takeaways for multiple statistics, uh, for multiple condition selectivity even. Uh, the basic approach is to combine per column statistics, you assume independence or, or some overlap, and this becomes very imprecise because you basically have no information about how conditions uh, are related. <coughs> the advanced approach is to use multi-column statistics. This is much better. This is also much harder to do, and while my school at MariaDB had always this non-conventional form of getting it, called records in range. Uh, <coughs> Okay, but with uh, your the multi-column selectivities bring certain challenges in them. Suppose you've got this condition of uh, where condition of which is in conjunction of multiple condition, and you get multiple multi-column statistics. And unlike single column statistics, multi-column statistics can overlap in all sorts of ways. Like here, you see single column statistics and there is multi column statistics. How do you combine them to get the selectivity of the whole condition? 
Uh, it would be nice to somehow take them all into account and uh, produce the estimated uses all information. <coughs> and the research paper, uh, the, the research papers actually show how to do that. Uh, the first one of them was published in 2005, uh, consistently si si estimating the selectivity of conjuncts of predicates. It introduces so-called maximum entropy principle which makes use of all available information from all, from all the partial statistics that you have, uh, and arrives at an estimate that's not that is fair, not biased, and so forth. However, it's very computationally hard, uh, in slow and difficult to code uh, this solution. Uh, there, then, after year 2005, the topic kind of didn't receive much coverage from the research community, but in the recent years, there is some kind of resurrection. Uh, this is an example, one of several papers that uh, appeared on the topic. And here, the fast entropy maximization for selectivity estimation of conjunctive predicates on CPU and GPU. Uh, so this is a newer algorithm. Uh, it's still hard. It's both computationally intensive, noting that they have to use GPU for just computing the combined selectivity, and uh, it's hard to code. I, I, it's not use, I'm not aware of it being actually used in production in any database. Uh, what is used in production? Well, much basic rules, uh, some way to prefer one statistic to another, some heuristics like statistics that uses more columns goes first. I think PostgreSQL uses that. Multi-column statistics go first. Or you can use something like minimize, try to minimize the number of independent assumptions you have to make, or pick the most selective statistics first, and so forth. <coughs> uh, what about MariaDB? <coughs> In MariaDB, we are reconciling, we have been in, in MySQL, in MariaDB and MySQL, we have been reconciling overlapping estimates you can find it commits as early in 2006, where it was range estimates and ref access estimates, and the code that tried to um, reconcile them together. Uh, the issue got substantially worse in 10.4 because the optimizer now has histogram data and it tries to use both histogram and range access data uh, to compute selectivity, uh, which uh, it, <coughs> it computes selectivity more aggressively, which causes more collisions. Uh, this resulted in uh, poor behavior in some cases, in actually quite a bit of cases. Uh, you can watch these and check out these in depth numbers. We need to fix this. Uh, we are working on this. Uh, I hope uh, that after this talk you will appreciate that this is not that easy. Uh, the workaround for now, if you are hitting uh, this problem with <coughs> poor plan because of overlapping statistics, is to just set the optimizer to use old way to basically ignore selectivity of <coughs> selectivity data from histograms. Set optimizer use case selectivity to one. Uh, <coughs> I don't have time to cover in this talk uh, joint condition selectivity at all, which is also a fascinating topic. Uh, <coughs> takeaways. Condition, computing condition selectivity is important, but it is also hard. In MariaDB 10.7, we've made a step forward. We introduced JSON HB histogram, which uh, <coughs> should be more precise for data with a lot of, uh, which has very common values and varchars. Uh, the work is underway to improve selectivity computations in the optimizer. Hope we will see improvement in the next version. Thanks for your attention. All right, Sergey. A very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you for this. Um, it's a, it's indeed a very interesting topic. All all of this uh, optimizer related um, challenges. Now um, we probably want to go a bit deeper into histograms. And I actually had a question that came up on uh, DB Stack Exchange quite recently. Uh, one user there was asking uh, something related to histograms, and that is, how often do you think you one should uh, collect histograms in MariaDB, and um, what what is the trade-off of not doing it very frequently? Well, uh, 
it really depends on uh, the, your data dynamics. Uh, for example, if you have a table that changes frequently, like you have a you know, web page or ad hits for this week, which you uh, flush weekly and then it keeps accumulating, then the data distribution changes very rapidly and you are it, and you better recollect the histogram after the flush and uh, every day maybe if you <clears throat> On the other hand, uh, for columns, for example, if you have users coming from different countries or states, uh, typically the distribution of users between states uh, and countries for a given service states is fairly constant over time. So here a more rare update is uh, can be done. Uh, I think some other databases do it like they do it to, uh, as soon as they detect that 10% of the roles have been updated, uh, they trigger automatic recollection process, uh, which we don't currently do because histogram collection is expensive and some people might not appreciate the background job uh, doing a full table scan, basically. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You did mention during your talk that um, had we had, if we had... Uh, a native sampling, we could do this automatically. It would make it a bit less expensive. But do you think that, um, or do you know if um, the uh, newest version of histograms is as expensive to collect as the old one? Is it, or is it uh, slightly cheaper? Well, uh, it's about the same. Uh, it's also uh, governed by, uh, I don't remember the variable name, histograms analyze sample ratio. Uh, so you can, if it takes too much time, you can uh, move the person, reduce the percentage that will get faster, but there is a limit. It still does, does a full table scan, basically. So it will get fast, much faster than uh, all the old histograms. Mm -hmm. Okay. And can you uh, explain to me a bit about the limitations of histograms? For example, when it comes to accuracy, um, you, you did mention that JSON histograms are more accurate than the previous versions, but uh, uh, they're obviously not going to be 100% accurate, uh, otherwise they wouldn't be a, a summary of the data. So when should I be concerned about the histogram accuracy and where can I consider it's acceptable? Well, uh, <clears throat> the histogram uh, accuracy, uh... Well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the current histograms are more accurate for the cases of popular values and varchar columns, so particularly the varchar columns of uh, which have, say, common prefix. Uh, uh, sometimes the data has something that it starts all, all, all values start with, and uh, uh, <clears throat> th th this is supposed to be uh, this. This this actually is better than the old histograms. Uh, other than that, I don't see any big issues uh, with histogram precision as such. I think if several, when you have hundreds of buckets and more or less up-to-date histogram, the precision is enough. Uh, we also need to think about what do we need it for. We need it actually to come up with a good query plan. Uh, and, so, and you don't really, you have a lot of other variables. So it does make sense to strive for 100% precision of histogram. And as I mentioned in the talk, uh, if you have queries with many multiple conditions, which people typically do have, mm -hmm. uh, then because you need, multi you need, ma you need many, also many possible query plans, if you have people, if, if you have query with multiple conditions, the biggest source of um, imprecision uh, and big and actual source of big error is unknown correlation between the data. So this will dwarf any imprecision of histograms. Right, and you did mention that we have records in range, which if we have an index that helps with getting uh, yeah, well, stability for correlated conditions. Yes, with indexes it helps, but uh, well, you, you can't have index on fields from different tables and there are other limitations when you, you can't always have an index for <laughs> all possible combinations yeah. that you may encounter. Yep, you're right. And this is particularly problematic if you have um, uh, if you have lots of indexes, the insert performance obviously goes down. And if we're talking about production performance, some people might get worried if they're trying to run uh, analyze on big tables. Uh, do we take any locks when we do analyze table? And does that affect the uh, performance? Yeah, well, it uh, the 
selects will still work. Uh, DML statements like inserts, deletes, updates will still work. Uh, DDL statements, uh, I think, including we count truncate tables DDL also, those will not work. Those will wait until the analysis is completed. Uh, but other than that, regular application workload of DML will still continue to function. Uh, although it will be a full table scan in the background, depends which uh, depends on the impact of that will depend on how loaded your system is. Let's put it this way. Yeah, and I also assume it's uh, down to the storage engine, which depending on the capabilities of the storage engine. Right. And well, let's say I have a very uh, active master, and I don't want to run analyze on uh, the master itself. Can I run analyze on the slave and then make use of that result on uh, the master machine? If I were to have some sort of replication chain, for example. Yeah, sure. That's uh, uh, definitely possible. Um, MySQL.com stats, the table which holds the histogram, is uh, just is it is uh, for, for the most part a regular table. You can insert data there, update the data there, then flash status. Uh, there may be one like caveat that uh, these the tables in MySQL database use special locking rules. So if you try to run insert into MySQL dot column stats select from some other table, you may encounter an error where it doesn't let you that. And there is some error complaining about locking strategies. Uh, you can easily work that around, but saving say the contents that you need to insert into temporary table or into user variable. But other, otherwise, you can just update the table, flush tables, and the new statistics will will be used after that. All right, that's that sounds like a very uh, very useful thing to to have. Now, uh, I think we have a time for one more question. Uh, so, another practical uh, question is: Do I have to decide on my own about the histogram size? And if I do, how big should I make it? Well, uh, I had a slide and I, I, this is actually the question that I asked it myself. And I had a slide about histogram sizes of, in uh, other databases. And uh, my current impression is that like in the, say his, the number of buckets should be in the order of 100, maybe 100, maybe 200 or somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, this should be sufficient uh, to, to get the precision that you might expect from a histogram in most cases. Okay, because it's basically one bucket. Uh, the number of buckets is in how many chunks you split all the rows in, of the table, effectively. Uh, right. Okay. Well, that, uh, uh, that was very informative. Thank you very much, Sergey, for the Q&A. Uh, very, very good okay. talk, and I hope to have a good interaction with the audience in Zulip as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, too.